Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crohn's and Colitis Canada's COVID-19 and IBD webinar. This webinar is being offered in English and French. To listen in French, please select Interpretation. It's the globe icon found in the web Zoom webinar bar and select French language. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, please try refreshing your website browser or relaunching the Zoom webinar. You can also comment to us in the Q&A box. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Crohn's and Colitis Canada's President and CEO, Lori Radke. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. As you might know, this month was Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Month. Every year throughout November, we share stories and content to highlight what these diseases mean and how they affect people, families, and the community as a whole. And the effort doesn't end here, though, as it's something we strive for every day as we work toward our mission. And one of the key ways we highlight this effort is through our annual Gutsy Walk. We'd ask that you please watch for our announcement next week as we launch our 2022 event scheduled for Sunday, June 5th, 2022. Mark your calendars. We hope you can come out and join us that day. And it's a fun time of year, a time to reflect and to remember all that we are thankful for as we get ready for the holidays. There are a number of campaigns underway to help support our work, whether it's through our gala, our raffles, Giving Tuesday, or our direct mail program, we are so grateful for the generosity that has allowed us to offer these webinars, our various programs, and also to drive forward new research. Thank you to our volunteers, our donors, researchers, and our community that have come together to support our cause. So tonight is our 28th webinar. We remain committed to hosting these COVID-19 and IBD webinars as long as you need us to along with providing some topical education events, such as the Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium. If you know of a teenager with IBD or are a caregiver to one, we have upcoming education events that may be of interest. Mental health and wellness is the focus this Sunday, November 28th at noon Eastern time. Managing IBD in school at the work and the workplace will be discussed next Sunday, December 5th, also at noon Eastern. This last session of the symposium features students and professionals discussing how to make school and work easier when you live with Crohn's or colitis. Both events are offered with simultaneous translation. To register, you can scan the QR code on the screen or visit our website. As always, our webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and Colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. Please watch for our emails and our at Get Gutsy Canada social media for updates. With that, a huge thanks to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Kevin Jacobson, Dr. Ann Pham Wee, and Dr. David Mack. Thank you also to BG Communications and to Mike the Interpreter for providing live French language interpretation. Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Benchmal are our moderators again tonight. Please welcome Dr. Gil Kaplan, Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, and past chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council. And Dr. Eric Benchmal, professor and pediatric gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, and the chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as the Crohn's and Colitis Canada board director. Thank you and wishing our very best to you and your families at this time. For those that celebrate, happy Hanukkah and all the best over the upcoming holiday season. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks a lot, Laurie. So it's been a little while, Gil. I guess okay. it's been about a month and a half. We, uh, your idea actually, we specifically timed this webinar 
to coincide with what we thought was going to be the approval by Health Canada and the rollout of vaccines for children aged 5 to 11. So we were hoping that this would work out, and indeed it did. Uh, vaccines are starting to roll out this week in Ontario, and I think in Alberta as well, right? And, and I think you're going to see that right across the entire country. And, and that's why it's so exciting to be able to host this webinar, and particularly everyone, the, all the panelists are pediatric specialists. Um, and I know so many people uh, in the IBD community, children, parents, families are all interested and curious about what this vaccine means. And, and again, and not to kind of steal the thunder of future talks, um, we're obviously recommending that, that children five to 11 are vaccinated. And it's not just a recommendation. Um, I have a 10 year old and a seven year old and they're registered and, and scheduled for their vaccines. And so um, this is, I think a great opportunity to learn why this is such the right decision to make for your kids. Yeah, and I have an 11 year old who's actually booked on the 28th to get her vaccine. And I have to say she's very anxious. She's a bit needle phobic. And so, but, you know, she knows that she's going to get it. She, there's never any question that she's going to get it. It's just when and how, and, uh, you know, she's doing it to protect her family members. She's doing it to protect herself. She's doing it because we want to travel one day. And so, uh, you know, I'm really proud of her that she's going to go ahead and get this done. And I think it's really important that our patients, you know, our, our IBD patients, most of whom uh, in this age group are immunosuppressed, it's really important that they get the vaccine as well. And so I'll review uh, some of the data about pediatrics, review some of the risks of side effects, and then we'll have an excellent panel uh, discussing you know, vaccine response in children, young adults with IBD, as well as discussing the risks and the benefits in children. And typically, I, I usually give a presentation right at the beginning, um, but I'm actually not today. I'm going to be deferring my time to you, Eric, so that you can have a focus on children with IBD. So I'll, with that, I will pass on the mic to you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, all righty. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So you should be able to see my slides now, similar as before. So I wanted to start just, uh, you know, this will be maybe 10, 15 minutes is the plan, but I really wanted to start to remind people or to teach people, I guess, in the audience as to what exactly it takes to get a drug or a vaccine to market uh, around the world. And, you know, most countries, most Western countries anyway, follow the same protocol and both the drug and vaccine manufacturers have to do the same things in many countries. So this is what we call sort of the clinical trial phases, uh, different clinical trials. So the phase one of clinical trial is really aimed at uh, evaluating safety of the drug and sometimes finding the most safe and best dose of the drug. It's usually very small and, uh, and that really is all it's for. It's sort of to plan to make sure that it's safe to move on in healthy volunteers and plan for phase two and three. Often in phase three, Two, uh, you get some sort of evaluation of effectiveness, but it's often not powered fully to tell you whether the drug is effective or not. And so the phase three trials are really where we're at in terms of, you know, the, the highest level of evidence for drug effectiveness and safety as well. And that is typically in very large uh, studies and monitor side effects, mon compares to another treatment. Often we like to see it compared to placebo if there's no other treatment that's on the market, for example. And we collect information on what happens to those patients, very careful information. Often the FDA is monitoring it if it's run in the United States, the European Medicines Agency in Europe, and Health Canada monitors phase three trials, really all phases of trials in Canada. And then phase four typically occurs after a drug is approved. And that's, again, to continue to monitor how the drug works in the real world scenario. So it's checking for effectiveness of the drug, but also monitoring for the risk of rare side effects, which maybe you couldn't do when you were in a phase three trial. This is another look at the sort of the, 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 the structure of the three phases of trial before approval. Uh, phase one is typically one to six months. Phase two is typically up to two years. And then phase three, depending on how many people you need to enroll, can take anywhere from 12 to 30 months. And then after that, it goes for regulatory review, which often at the FDA in the US can take years to get regulatory review. I think what's worth noting is that for the COVID vaccines, this is really what was compressed. So the time required to get past phase three is what was compressed. 
we were able to run the trials much quicker and enroll a lot more participants very quickly. And then the FDA also, while they did the same review that they would normally do, they assigned more people to it so that it was done quicker. So while it may feel like some of these vaccines are rushed through, the reality is that all of these other parts of the phases of trials are exactly the same, uh, not rushed at all. But in fact, what we did was shorten the, you know, the red tape, right? Shorten the time that it would require to get a drug through to phase three. Um, so it's worth noting also that, you know, these numbers of participants through phase one, two, and three in vaccine trials, phase three is a lot more participants. And I'll explain why in just a second. You know, again, we, we reviewed what the study purposes of phase one, two, and three were. And you can see that most drugs that go through phase one clinical trials never make it to phase three clinical trials and certainly never make it to regulatory review and approval uh, and make it to market. So it's really high risk for the drug companies to put a drug through because they don't really know whether it's going to be effective in humans, right? They've done the studies in animals, but don't know about humans. So how are vaccine trials different from the regular standard clinical trials? So I think the main difference uh, in vaccine trials is that the ethical burden is increased. So we're not trying to treat a disease in vaccine trials, right? We're trying to prevent infection with a certain virus. And therefore you're giving the drug, the vaccines, to healthy individuals, often to children, because most vaccines are given in childhood. And so the, the ethical burden of not causing harm is increased. And so that changes the entire structure and how we evaluate the trials. As I mentioned, it's about preventing disease and we need to understand the risk of catastrophic adverse events because unfortunately, as with any drug, vaccines could cause severe outcomes, bad outcomes. And we absolutely need to make sure that those catastrophic events are extremely rare and that the benefits of the vaccine, both to the individual and to society, outweigh these catastrophic events. Typically with vaccine trials, the long-term risks are less of a concern. And I, I'm going to probably emphasize this multiple times today. So if you come away with one message through this webinar, it's this. There has not been a vaccine in human history that has caused an adverse event beyond 60 days after you give it. So a lot of people are talking about the long-term risks of these vaccines, these new mRNA vaccines in children. And there is no biologic reason to believe that there would be some long-term risk years down the road uh, in children or adults because vaccines leave your system after they've been injected within 60 days and nothing has ever caused an adverse event beyond 60 days uh, in a vaccine trial or in the real world. And we'll talk about some of the serious adverse events that vaccines have had because they're not risk-free but certainly beyond 60 days is just not, not a thing. It's not, uh, not seen. Um, phase three trials are usually thousands of volunteers, not hundreds of volunteers for vaccine trials. Again, to evaluate, is the vaccine safe? Is it effective? And what are the most common side effects for the vaccine? And then, you know, often with vaccines, unfortunately, we don't see these rare adverse events, these one in a million or one in a hundred thousand until the vaccine gets to market, because again, they're so rare, right? So with drugs, it's very unusual that you're going to give drugs to one to a hundred thousand people or a million people within a short period of time. With vaccines, we see that because we're giving them all at once. There certainly has been drugs that have been given to a million people. And we realized that there was risk, there were side effects after, you know, a huge number of people got it. But with vaccines, that's usually the only time that we see these rare, rare, rare side effects. So examples of these rare side effects in COVID vaccines were the blood clots that we saw with AstraZeneca and then the myocarditis risk we see. And I'll talk more about this with the mRNA vaccines. So do other vaccines have rare side effects? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the classic example that we were all taught in med school was the live polio vaccine that was released in 1955. And it was recognized that one in about two and a half million children were at risk for an encephalitis or a paralysis disease as a result of this live polio vaccine. But I want to emphasize that that one in two and a half million was balanced by polio infecting 60,000 children in 1952 alone and causing 3,000 deaths. So despite that one in two and a half million, North America used the live polio vaccine and almost eradicated polio 
uh, right up until an inactivated polio vaccine was developed in, 19, in the 1990s. Uh, so despite this risk, this very rare risk, which is absolutely catastrophic and horrific if, if uh, you've ever seen a child with this, we continue to use it because the benefits outweighed this very small risk. Swine flu vaccine in 1976, about one in 100,000 got a, a neurologic condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can cause paralysis and even death. And that was 17 times more frequent than natural infection. And we only realized it after the vaccine went to market. Now, the flu vaccine we give now, there's also a risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, about one in a million, I think the number is. So it's much more rare, but it's there. And then getting the flu, right? Getting any virus, you have a risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome as well. So again, we're measuring whether the benefits outweigh these rare risks. And then in pediatrics, uh, more recently, uh, there was a rotavirus vaccine that came out in the 1990s. And it wasn't until it was on the market in many countries that we realized that it caused a rare bowel condition uh, called intussusception in babies. And that risk was one or two in 10,000. And the risk was about 20 to 30 times higher than in the general population. And this time that vaccine was pulled off the market as soon as it was recognized. It was pulled off the market within a year of the, uh, of the problem being recognized because you were giving you know, the rotavirus vaccine to babies who are otherwise well. And rotavirus in most cases, especially in the Western world in, in developed nations, rotavirus does not usually cause death. Uh, many kids got rotavirus and survived with IV fluids and treatment in, a, in a, an advanced hospital. It causes a lot of death in developing nations in low and middle income countries. So, you know, again, there was always the question of whether we should have continued to do that in low and middle income countries, but it was pulled off the market by the company. And then in 2006, we had two new rotavirus vaccines that were licensed, and we give them routinely around the world now. But even then, we didn't recognize the risk of interception until years later. The risk was a lot lower uh, than in the original rotavirus vaccine, but there is still thought to be a 1 in 40,000 risk of interception. So with all of that in mind, so sort of how vaccines come to market and the risk of rare side effects, Let's talk a little bit about this trial, which is the, the trial that was published on November 9th uh, for the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine, which now the brand name is Comirnaty. I can barely pronounce it. We still call it the Pfizer vaccine. And this is to look at the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine in children aged 5 to 11. So this is the, the study design. Actually, in this publication, they reported both the phase one trial, which looked at doses and risk of side effects in healthy individuals. Uh, and in the phase one trial, I'm not gonna review it too much, but they, they decided, so they looked at 10 and 20 and 30 micrograms. Adults get 30 micrograms of the vaccine. They found that 10 micrograms was probably the lowest, safest and most effective dose based on 50 individuals. So they took this 10 microgram dose and they brought it to a combined phase two and three study and they gave it to 1,500 healthy children, age 5 to 11, and 750 children got a placebo injection, two placebos injections. So uh, this was a two-dose vaccine, like it is in adults, spaced three weeks apart, and we'll come back to that in a second, but the same as the adult design, essentially all the same as the adult design. Uh, they also looked at, so they compared the, the, you know, the vaccine vaccinated patients to placebo. Neither the patients nor the doctors knew what they were getting. Uh, and they followed them forward to look at risk of COVID infection uh, in the two to three months afterwards. So the average length of follow-up in this trial was two and a half months. They also compared to the original phase three trial in young adults, 16 to 25, to look at immune response. So antibody levels in these children who got a third of the dose compared to young adults, teenagers, young adults, 16 to 25, who got the full dose. And this is the bottom line result. And I think anybody, even if you can't read science, if you don't know anything about science, you can see that this is a very, very striking result. So the blue line is the people, the children who got the vaccine, 10 micrograms followed forward days after the first dose. Uh, they all got the th second dose on day 21. And the red line is placebo, and that's your risk of developing uh, COVID infection proven by PCR. And you can see that 
obviously the vaccine is much better than placebo and vaccine effectiveness was around 91% regardless of whether or not the ch child had a previous COVID infection and almost exactly the same when you excluded children with a previous COVID infection because maybe giving them the vaccine will make them even more immune. Uh, it was almost exactly the same in children without a previous COVID infection. There were no cases of severe COVID-19, hospitalization, ICU admission, or death. And there were no cases of the that rare form of COVID-19 that we see sometimes in children, the multi-system inflammatory uh, disorder of COVID. There were also no cases of myocarditis. Um, this is the serologic results to look at whether the antibodies, these are neutralizing antibodies, and we'll come back to what that means in a second, but neutralizing antibodies against COVID. And essentially, you know, this is the, the number exactly the same between the children and the young adults who got 30 micrograms. And this is, you know, the, the proportion, the ratio of antibodies. If this number crosses one, it means it's not statistically significant. So there was no significant difference in the antibody levels in children who got a third of the dose compared to the teenagers, young adults who got 30 micrograms. So good news. These are the side effects that they documented. Uh, these are the more local side effects in the trial. Uh, you can see, not surprisingly, more common redness, swelling, pain at injection site, both after dose one and after dose two for the uh, patients who got the vaccine. And these are the systemic side effects. And sort of bottom line here is, like I said, you had more mild to moderate injection site pain, uh, a very small number with severe injection site pain, a small number had fatigue, headaches, chills, muscle pain, and there were, there were more symptoms after dose two, you can see that. And you know, all of us adults who got the vaccine can totally understand that, right? I think a lot of us experience many of these side effects uh, after getting the vaccine. There really was not overall only a very slight increased risk of side effects. So remember that the placebo also had side effects, uh, whether they were perceived or real side effects. You know, there was not a significantly increased, you know, a very slightly significantly increased rate of vaccine related side effects in uh, children after 30 days if they got the vaccine compared to get, if they got the placebo. There were no serious adverse events related to the vaccine or placebo. So what we still don't know is anything about this risk of myocarditis. So this is sort of the thing that all of us are very well aware was kind of a surprise and came up after we had vaccinated millions of people with the mRNA vaccines, that the, there was this risk of heart inflammation, heart muscle inflammation after getting the vaccine. And I want to go through a little bit about what that means for, uh, for people who get the vaccine and just go through that there are multiple forms of myocarditis. There's the classic form of myocarditis that you're at risk of getting if you get any virus, if you get a fungus, if you get medication. Uh, then there's the myocarditis associated with co getting COVID-19 itself, being infected. There's the myocarditis in children of having this MIS-C uh, disorder. And then there's the myocarditis related to given, getting the COVID-19 vaccine. So looking at the COVID-19 vaccine, and this is up to date as of November 2nd, um, looking at the, the myocarditis related to the vaccine, you can see that there is a slightly increased risk of myocarditis, especially in males and especially in young males. I wanna go back and just, uh, I didn't say it yet, but we'll talk about it in a second, but I actually do wanna show you this. So the risk of myocarditis in this age group in the general population is about 18 per million people. So if you go back to this number, you know this is the risk per million doses of the vaccine. You can see that it's not all that different from the 18 per million in the 15 to 18 year old age group, but obviously it's higher than the baseline population that we see in the United States. Another thing to note is that it, it's highest in 16 to 17 year olds, and it actually drops off, it's less, less increased in younger patients. So that's important when we think about uh, what the risk might be in a five to 11 year old. If it's the same trend, it's probably lower than in the 16 and 17 year old. Classic myocarditis, like I, can set, like I said, it can be 
due to many, many things, including immunologic diseases, including we've seen it rarely with, in people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You can get myocarditis as a result of the inflammation. The annual incidence of myocarditis is about 0.8 in 100,000 people, and it decreases the older you get. In 15 to 18 year olds, that's kind of the, the peak onset of myocarditis. It's about, like I said, 18 in a million or 1.8 per 100,000 people. What's important is that this classic myocarditis is two thirds males. So very similar to what we're seeing in the COVID vaccine situation, but mortality is not good, right? It's, it's about one in 20 people with this classic myocarditis die. And, you know, one in 20 to one in 10 need a, a heart transplant as a result of the myocarditis. So very bad outcomes if you get classic myocarditis. Also very bad outcomes if you get myocarditis related to getting Miss C after getting a COVID-19 infection. In fact, the rate of myocarditis in Miss C patients from this study is about 18% of their population. And, you know, the bottom line to all of this is that it's bad. It's very severe when you're getting it in Miss C. By contrast, just getting it because of a COVID infection is pretty rare. So these are from two hospital electronic health record databases. You can see that myocarditis was, about, was present in about two in a thousand people who uh, get COVID-19 compared to 8% who got Miss C. And this is about one in a thousand who got COVID-19 compared to 9% who got Miss C. So it's there, it's not zero. Uh, but it's much lower than when you get MSC. I have to say that, again, remembering that the risk after the vaccine is much high, much lower, rather, the risk of myocarditis is much lower after the vaccine than it is after a COVID infection. So that's why we give it still to teenagers, because the benefit of getting the vaccine outweighs this risk of myocarditis. This study just was published uh, ahead, of ahead of peer review. So this is not a peer reviewed study. So take it with a grain of salt, but it is the largest case series of kids with COVID vaccine related myocarditis. And they actually compare kids at, at Children's Hospital Atlanta, uh, 201 patients who got myocarditis and looked at vaccine related, classic and Miss C related myocarditis. Uh, they found that the vaccine patients were much more mild at diagnosis with myocarditis. They were less likely to need treatment, medications for the myocarditis, less likely to be admitted to the ICU because of their myocarditis, so about 20% compared to 60% overall. And none of those patients with, with uh, the vaccine-related myocarditis needed ventilation as compared to 68% with MIS-C and 42% with classic myocarditis. This is a really important slide as well. So this looks at the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart, which assesses how well the heart is pumping. So what the ejection fraction is how much blood can be ejected with one heart pump. And in the patients with viral vaccine-related myocarditis, the green line here, they actually resolved all of them, all nine with vaccine-related myocarditis, resolved within five days. And their ejection fraction after that was completely normal as opposed to with classic myocarditis, only about 70% of them resolved, 30 of 42 resolved when they followed them forward. And MIS-C related myocarditis, about 139 of 146 resolved. So it seems like the myocarditis associated with the vaccine is much more rare and much less severe than these other forms of myocarditis. So in conclusion, the mRNA vaccine is highly effective at preventing COVID-19 uh, infection in children. Uh, similar effectiveness as adults, we think, and even at a lower dose. Side effects are minor and not usually more frequent than placebo, at least not systemic side effects. We're still uncertain about this risk of myocarditis, but it certainly seems like the risk of myocarditis if you get COVID-19 is higher than with the vaccine. It's highest in males age 16 to 17, and it's lower in patients age 12 to 15. And we'll see about the younger children going forward. So overall, the, vac the benefits of the vaccine outweighs the risk in children aged 5 to 11. And so these are the recommendations about the vaccine that came out from Health Canada and NACI. NACI recommends that a complete series of the COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to children 5 to 11 years old who don't have any contra contraindications with a dosing interval of at least eight weeks apart between the first and second dose. And we'll come back to that. And Health Canada authorized the vaccine 
given 21 days apart, simply because that's what Health Canada does is they authorize drugs based on the clinical trials and based on what the company, what the manufacturer recommends and asks for rather, whereas NASI tries to recommend the best use of medications, but the best use of, of uh, vaccines based on our scientific knowledge. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And I would like to introduce Dr. Kevin Jacobson, but first I'm gonna take a drink of water, sorry, Kevin. It's getting dry, it's winter time. <laughs> So Dr. Jacobson is Associate Professor and Senior Clinical Scientist in the Department of Pediatrics at the Child and Family Research Institute at BC Children's. <coughs> and Dr. Jacobson, I'm going to let you take it away because my voice is shot. <coughs> Thanks, Eric. Um... So Eric's given a nice uh, segue into to my uh, presentation and having shown that in children, the vaccine is highly efficacious and, uh, and safe. In healthy children, we'll, we'll now look at uh, the safety or the effectiveness and to some extent the safety of this vaccine in, in children with inflammatory bowel disease who are on some of our therapies um, and specifically our more potent therapies, our biologic therapies and immune modulators. But before I do that, I'm going to just give an introduction uh, and talk a little bit about a couple of the adult studies and then contrast that with the pediatric study that we have done. Uh, a couple of studies done in the UK, published fairly recently, showed the following. In the first study, it's referred to as the Clarity Studies, where they looked at infliximab in adult patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And what they showed was a blunted antibody response to a single uh, dose of the Pfizer vaccine. In a follow-up study, they looked at antibody responses after two doses uh, in patients uh, on now anti-TNF agents, so it includes infl infliximab, adenlimumab, but they received either the Pfizer vaccine or the uh, Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. And again, they showed that there was a suppression in antibody responses after the second dose uh, to up to five-fold uh, suppression of the antibody levels. They also showed that the antibody levels in these patients rapidly decreased by 14 weeks after the vaccine dose. So not only was the antibody response blunted, but there was a rapid decline in the antibody levels after the second uh, vaccine dose in these IBD patients on anti-TNF therapies. But in contrast to that, with one of the agents that we use to treat inflammatory bowel disease called bedlizumab, which blocks T cell, uh, which is a white cell migration into the gut, they showed that the antibody levels were maintained up to 16 weeks. So they showed there was a differential effect on the antibody response, depending upon the type of medication uh, and biologic therapy that you were on. In addition, they showed that uh, the T cell responses, which is part of the immune cells that protect us from infection and help also contribute to antibody, they were suppressed in up to 20% of patients on both anti-TNF therapies and vitalizumab after the second dose of either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, as, you, as Eric has indicated, uh, in, in general, adolescents uh, and children have a very robust antibody response and, uh, uh, to vaccines, uh, all vaccines, and the antibody response is, is more robust than in adults. And uh, this was also observed in, in the Pfizer vaccine trials. But in the Pfizer vaccine trials, the true impact of the immunosuppressant therapies, and as I indicated, the biologic therapies and or the immune modulators uh, were not evaluated in the vaccine trials because these patients were excluded from the clinical trials. So as a result, we have the population. We felt that it was essential to do this. Uh, we undertook the study to evaluate the effectiveness, how effective the vaccine is 
on our patients on biologic therapies, and then also look at the durability of the vaccine responses, so how long the antibody levels stay high uh, over a period of time. And in our first cohort, we recruited adolescents 12 to 17 years of age, treated with the anti-TNF agents, either alone or in combination with an immune modulator who received the Pfizer vaccine. Now, the anti-TNF therapies were predominantly in fliximab. We had a few patients on adalimumab, and they were treated, as I said, either alone or in combination with the immune modulator, which is azathioprine or methotrexate. Um, Following their vaccination, well, we did actually, we, we drew serum uh, to test the antibody levels. Uh, and these are antibody levels to the viral proteins measured at baseline where we could, but mostly 28 days after the first vaccination and 33 uh, months, sorry, after the second vaccination. But in between the 28 days and the three months, they had received their second dose, sorry, it was three months after the first vaccination. Uh, and so we looked at uh, specific viral proteins and antibodies to these viral proteins. And we looked at the spike protein, the receptor binding domain, and the nuclear capsid protein. And as I said, specifically, we look at antibodies directed at these particular proteins produced by the virus. That's the assay that we used. Uh, and we also measured, as Eric indicated, viral neutralizing capacity against the live virus and that's done in the lab so you take the blood and you expose the uh, the uh, patient's uh, uh, serum which contains the antibodies to the virus and you see if you can neutralize the virus infecting capacity into a host cell the antibodies response also has, antibody responses sorry also being evaluated at one year after the first vaccine, so to look at the longevity uh, of the response. To date, we've recruited 141 adolescents, uh, and we compared their antibody responses to a healthy adult cohort, much like Eric showed. And we would have, in an ideal circumstance, compared this to an age-matched healthy pediatric cohort. But given the pandemic and the circumstances, this was not really so easy to do. Now, while this slide looks fairly complicated, it, it really is quite straightforward. And what we, we, sh we show here is the antibody responses to the spark protein and to the receptor binding domain. If you look in the left-hand panel, this is the level on the y-axis. On the baseline, it indicates at baseline, day 28 and three months. And these are the antibodies directed against the receptor binding domain. And this is against the spark protein. The solid circles are adult patients. The little squares are the pediatric IBD patients on infliximab alone. And the triangles are the pediatric IBD patients on infliximab together with an immune modulate. These are the baseline levels. They are not significantly different, although they're a little higher than in the adult patient population. We can come back to that. If you look at day 28, with respect to the antibody in the to the receptor binding domain, healthy adults, infliximab monotherapy, infliximab combination therapy. And what you can see that there is a difference in the antibody response in those patients who are on infliximab monotherapy versus infliximab combination therapy, in that those on combination therapy had lower antibody levels than those on infliximab monotherapy, which was similar to healthy adult controls. Then we move out to three months and you see that if we move across the three, the three box plots, you can see in the patient population who is on infliximab combination therapy, you now see that the antibody response at three months is much more robust. And it's no different to those on infliximab alone or those uh, healthy adults. So while at day 28, the response was suppressed uh, at three months, the response was similar to those on monotherapy and controls. If we look at these spark protein responses, baseline, day 28, again, you can see in those patients on infliximab combination therapy, the antibody response is lower, but not significantly lower than those on infliximab monotherapy, uh, but it is significantly lower than those adult healthy patients. 
Again, if we move to the three month period, you can see that the antibody response is much more robust in those patients on infliximab combination therapy. And now it's no different to those on infliximab monotherapy and healthy control. So you can see with those two antibody responses that while the antibody response after the first vaccination is suppressed in those in combination therapy, similar to one of the adult studies, at three months following the second vaccination, the antibody response is much more robust and not different. Now, if we look right across to the right-hand uh, uh, panel, uh, figure B over here, you can see live virus neutralizing titers or capacity. This again, the same colors uh, apply. The, yeah, the black round circles, healthy patients, the squares are infliximab monotherapy and the triangles are infliximab combination therapy. And you can see in comparison to the healthy controls, those on infliximab monotherapy, their virus neutralizing capacity is very similar. In contrast, we see that it is suppressed in those on infliximab combination therapy. And I'll come back to that a little later. So in summary, in our preliminary analysis, and I didn't indicate, we didn't look at all 141 patients. We looked at 41 patients of the 141 patients in this pediatric RDD cohort on, in, on maintenance infliximab monotherapy antibody concentrations were similar to uninfected healthy adults after the first Pfizer dose. In contrast, those on infliximab in combination with an immune modulator, antibody concentrations were significantly lower than healthy controls after the first Pfizer dose. However, after two Pfizer doses, there were no differences in antibody responses three months after the first vaccine dose in those on infliximab alone or on infliximab in combination with an immune modulator compared to healthy controls. And below there, I've just provided the median interval between the first and second doses, which was 46 days. And the range was 42 to 86, which is similar to, I think, to what Eric indicated towards the end of his presentation. But what we did show is that the neutralizing capacity was low in those on combination therapy. And I mentioned earlier on that I would indicate what I think is going on, and we're not sure yet at this point in time, but I think it is due to high methotrexate dosing. So many of our children are on infliximab, particularly the young males in combination with methotrexate, and it's usually low-dose methotrexate, and I don't think that's an issue. I think the antibody responses are adequate. But I think it's in those patients who are high dose methotrexate and in combination with infliximab that seems to suppress their neutralizing antibody capacity. But as I said, our sample size is fairly small and this uh, needs further evaluation to determine whether it's truly the case or not. So in summary, our study provides preliminary evidence of a reduced antibody response to Pfizer vaccine in children on infliximab in combination with an immune modulator. However, our data also shows that most pediatric patients receiving infliximab either as mono or combination therapy develop acceptable antibody responses compared to adults. And uh, though these results are based on small sample size, as I indicated, they provide reassuring data and contrast with the data that was reported in those uh, a few adult studies that I indicated at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, similar to what Eric said in the healthy uh, uh, pediatric cohort, the vaccination is well tolerated. And now I can say uh, that there are no serious adverse events for the whole uh, 141 pediatric uh, sample. There's ongoing analysis, including T cell responses, because that, that's really important for us to understand the relationship between T cells and B cells and antibody responses, and also T cell memory and long term responses. And it also helps us understand as to when the uh, additional vaccination should be given uh, um, following the second vaccination, as you heard, this is happening as we speak. We also need to further understand the impact on the neutralizing capacity, and that will help us understand uh, the efficacy of the uh, vaccination strategies that we have applied.
So just a final uh, couple of comments and acknowledgement, and then I'll end. Uh, as Eric has indicated, uh, the rollout for the five to 11 year old patients with IBD has begun, and we have started recruiting five to 11 year olds. The plan this time is also to try and include healthy age matched uh, non IBD patients who are no medications. And before I end, I'd like to recognize the uh, the team members that have helped with this because we had to activate this process very quickly because we don't always know when these uh, 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 rollouts are actually going to occur. Uh, I'd like to recognize Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Pascal Lavar, and Dr. Levitt, uh, who are all clinicians, Dr. Shar and Dr. Rice, who are our PhD scientists, and then some of our students, Dr. Sudan, Dr. Golden, and Dr. Majdubi, who are involved in patient recruitment. And also finally to indicate that this work has been uh, supported and funded by CITF and the Moffat Family Foundation. Uh, and I'll stop there and we'll be happy to take uh, uh, questions uh, uh, when appropriate. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobson. Appreciate it. And I apologize for the uh, choppy introduction. I'll do it again for you. This is what I get for this is my second webinar. I co-hosted another webinar early today. Apparently my voice can't handle it, but so like I said, Dr. Jacobson is Associate Professor and Senior Clinical Scientist in the Department of Pediatrics uh, at the, and the Child and Family Research Institute at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. And Dr. Jacobson, you can turn back on your, your uh, camera. We're going to introduce the rest of the panel today and ask some questions. Uh, Dr. Pham Hui, who has been a guest before on this webinar, is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ottawa, Physician Lead of the Primary Immunodeficiency Clinic and Pediatric Infectious Diseases Consultant at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and she's Chair of Immunize Canada as well. And Dr. David Mack, uh, who is on our task force and has been a guest as well on previous webinars, is professor uh, in the Department of Pediatrics and gastroenterologist, uh, as well as director of the CHEO IBD Center at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario uh, in Ottawa, Canada. So welcome both Dr. Mack and Dr. Pham Hui. And I'm actually gonna start with uh, perhaps a couple of questions for Dr. Jacobson. Um, can you speak a little bit, we, we had previously reviewed in detail the Clarity IBD study. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the differences between Clarity IBD and your study? In particular, maybe do you wanna emphasize the difference between neutralizing antibodies that which you measured and the anti-spike antibodies which right. were measured in Clarity? So, um... You know, as indicated, there are different antibodies that are produced by us in response to the viral proteins that are expressed by the protein. And there's the spark protein, the receptor binding domain protein, and this binds to the host uh, uh, ACE2 receptor. And what the neutralizing, and, and it, once that ligation or once that interaction and binding occurs, you get internalization of the virus into the host cell uh, because it has a parasitic uh, um, a, a like cycle and it uh, replicates, et cetera, et cetera, and does its thing. Um, the, the antibody binds to, uh, actually prevents the binding and the ligation of the spark protein receptor binding domain to the actual uh, uh, host receptor, and by doing that, it neutralizes the virus and prevents it from entering into the cell, and therefore it undergoes cell death or, or it, it dies. Now, the the spark protein antibody correlates quite well with, I think, the the neutralizing capacity. Now, one of the big differences between the Clarity study and ours was we both used an ELISA to measure the antibody levels was just a different ELISA and different units that we use. So you can't directly compare uh, our antibody levels to, to their antibody levels. But, you know, other than that, in general terms, you, you can take away the concepts in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, well, you can't do the direct comparison, as I said, you can conceptualize the the, the, the similarities and differences based on how they relate to, you, you know, their control populations, I think. 
Thank you. That's great. And I, I have to say, Dr. Pham Hui at a previous webinar reviewed T-cell immunity very well and what that was. You can go back and look at that. I think it was in April. Uh, but the Clarity study did show that these antibodies correlate quite well, at least with the Pfizer vaccine, with T-cell immunity in the IBD patients. So while they're all measuring different components of things, they seem to correlate well with immunity. And in the end, I think there was a question in the, from the audience about live agent response. In the end, these same antibodies, maybe Dr. Pham Hui can correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not a, an immunologist, but these same antibody responses occur when you get infected with natural virus as well, correct? Yeah, to a certain degree. I mean, um, when you're being uh, infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you're exposed to the whole, you know, the, the spike protein, but the whole uh, virus itself. So you're gonna be producing antibodies to a variety of different things for the vaccine you're targeting just the S, uh, the spike protein. So um, it's it's very targeted. Um, not quite the same thing, but in terms of like that, that has been identified as really that the, the main target. And then can, <laughs> can I ask you a, a follow-up question? Like a lot of the studies, including uh, Kevin's brilliant study in, in children's IBD, uh, you know, report antibodies. And, and really in, in Canada, antibody testing is a research domain. So we're doing this part of research studies. It's not something that we're doing clinically. And I just wanted to get your sense. Do you, should we be doing antibody tests to confirm that people have an antibody response to the vaccine? And wh wh what do you think about that as a clinical practice? No, you're right. So antibody testing at this point in time is is not it's using only a, a select group of clinical settings. So, um, so for your question of should we be measuring these, I think not yet, not now. Um, the main reason is that it's quite variable the antibody response, you know, whether after infection or after vaccine. Uh, some are to a certain degree homogeneous, uh, like similar, but there's a, a lot of variability. And the key factor is that we actually don't know what the what we call the correlate of protection. So we don't know that actual magic number that means, you know, that you won't get infected or you won't get symptomatic or you won't transmit. So we're, we're waiting to, to determine this, this correlate of protection. Um, so for the time being, I think um, measuring an antibody level may not give you um, information that is clinically relevant, at least in, in this setting. So Gil, I'd, I'd like to jump in. Uh, I mean, absolutely, and, and I agree. But, I, I, you know, it'd be nice to get to a point where it is commercialized and standardized and, and replicated and validated and across board, you know, Eric doesn't have to ask a question, what's the difference between the UK, you know, assay and our assay, and are they comparable? But it would be nice when we get to the point where we're able to look at the antibody level starting to decline or decay, at which point, you, you know, we will be able to determine more from a biological perspective when to give the booster as opposed to extrapolating from, a, from other conditions. So, I mean, if this virus is going to be around for many years to come, and I suspect it will be uh, from what everybody is saying, it would be nice to know for us potentially whether it's on a population basis or on a community basis, at which point the levels start to decline and at which point the the next vaccine should be given. And if I, and if I, I also ask, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anne. I was just to quickly follow up on that. I think that might be the direction where we go to. And I, you know, similar to things like hepatitis B or tetanus, we actually know the number, uh, like the antibody level that is required or that is considered protective. So sometimes we do measure these levels in patients. Uh, and then we see that if they're under a certain level, they, uh, they need a booster or an additional dose uh, to bring that antibody level higher higher than that that known level. Uh, so in this context, we just don't know it yet, but I think you're right that probably down the road, um, we might get to that level and it would be useful to know uh, if, it's, if, it's a, if a booster is required or, or any other intervention. Kevin, just a quick question to follow up on your, on your brilliant presentation. I mean, obviously the, the work was done in, in 12 and older kids because that's where the vaccine is approved. Do you expect to see any differences when you, when you go down to the 5 to 11 age group? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, hopefully we have enough children to be able to look at whether there are differences in the antibody responses. So I thought you were going to ask me if there are differences in ethnic responses, you know? So... Uh, uh, you know, there's an extended part to the question. So I, I don't know, uh, Eric. I mean, I may be able to answer a little bit better. I mean, as Eric pointed out, the dosing, 
uh, microgram dosing is lower and yet we're assuming that the antibody response will be similar. So I, I don't know that it's going to be more robust, but potentially similar to, uh, to what we see in the, the older kids, but with a lower dose. And, and just to follow up on, on Kevin's point, Kevin's actually a world-renowned expert in looking at South Asians with IBD, which is a high proportion within, within British Columbia. And, and, and just to follow up on your point, did, did you notice any differences between different ethnicities associated with, um, with IBD? No, you, you know, we haven't really looked at that. I mean, we're looking at the 100, we're looking at every child now. So, you know, give us a few weeks and I'll, I'll be able to answer that question. But to be honest, I don't, I don't suspect we will see a difference. Uh, you know, while they, they present differently, they respond similarly to the medications that we use. So I anticipate that their antibodies and Anne may be able to answer this better than, than I do, but I suspect the antibody responses will be similar. Great, thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to pivot to David uh, as a gastroenterologist who treats lots of children with IBD. What are your recommendations for these patients? So what's what's the nitty gritty? Should children with IBD be getting the vaccine? Well, I think vaccines are really our friends in general terms. Um, so I I do recommend vaccines, uh, and not just this vaccine, but all vaccines. Uh, we've watched titers at the time of diagnosis for the ones we can measure. And if they're low, um, suggest the parents get the vaccination. So I think this is one of a complement of vaccinations that we should be looking at. Would you be worried at all uh, about any implications on their IBD? Well, I, I think I'm more worried about infections. Uh, causing troubles with their IBD. We have not seen it. Uh, we haven't looked at COVID per se, but uh, just something more common, uh, influenza. Uh, we did see more um, children who were hospitalized and flared their IBD that got influenza disease itself. And we just have, don't see it with the vaccination. And in fact, we, we, you were involved with that study that we did Ontario wide in all children with IBD in Ontario. And we found, we were looking to see whether uh, they had a risk of flare up after their flu vaccines. And we found that in the years that the children got their flu vaccine compared to years where they didn't get the flu vaccine, they actually saw the doctor more often for IBD related reasons. So we think that may be an indication, like you said, that what we see clinically is that if you get a virus, you're more likely to flare up. and so. Uh, that may be the case with COVID as well as flu, not just with uh, flu or stomach bugs. And so, Eric, just one practical point. Um, if you do get infected with COVID-19, um, often your gastroenterologist actually has to hold your medications while you recover from the medications. And if, for example, you're on a drug like Humira, which you're, you're taking every week, potentially every second week, a few delay of that you can actually get into uh, situations where your drug levels fall, and then you can actually start to flare from, from having to hold your medication, things like that. So, so you have to balance, and, and Eric, you did a brilliant job talking about the balance between the benefits and the risks, and you have to look at that at both sides of the coin. Absolutely. Uh, and Gil, to extend that, uh, absolutely right, but e even more worrisome is if the levels fall to zero and the body then immunizes against the biologic agents and we just can't yeah. use them anymore. Yeah, for sure. So related to that, David, with, with respect to those biologic agents, a lot of times we get the question of, uh, you know, should I get it right before I get my injection or infusion? Should I get it midway through the cycle? Should I time the vaccine based on, you know, what my biologic infusions are doing? So, yeah, that is a common question. The logistics can become, you know, complex when you've got COVID and influenza and some of these intervals of these biologics, as you know, are shortened. So I think that, you know, the biggest, the biggest issue is um, if people are having troubles, is it, is it the vaccination giving you, you know, some of those symptomatologies that you talked about? Some of the people would have trouble with their biologic infusions and it gets quite confusing. So I would, I usually tell the patients don't get it you know, on the same days. 
if you can time it somewhere in between them, probably better. Uh, but it, it becomes logistically difficult. Yeah, it does. And I mean, that's the same reason I think uh, most of the governments are saying that you shouldn't give a child the COVID vaccine within two weeks of the flu vaccine, not because they interact in any way or that they're going to cause problems with one another. You just don't know what which one is doing the side effect if you have one, right? So yeah. it's a similar kind of concept. Uh, what if they're on steroids? Should they hold off on the vaccine? Well, steroids is kind of an interesting question. And, and I think... Um, I think I would answer this in, in two different ways. And, and one thing that's that's coming up is, well, you know, my 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 kid has had two COVID vaccinations now, uh, and and they've, you know, newly diagnosed or flared. You know, what should I do? You know, uh, really with the with staying home from school and COVID vaccinations and all that. And, and I and I think I've become more individualized than before people had vaccinations and, and and you know in our community it's relatively low. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, if if a kid's coming in and newly diagnosed and really quite sick. So you know lost weight and high inflammatory markers, really fatigued, um, you know the these children are at risk of all sorts of infections, not just COVID. And if they're going on prednisone, I think it's I've, I've gone more back to what I used to do and just saying, you know, maybe they should stay home and and uh, start to recover till we see the end to see if we've had any effect of the prednisone. So that's usually you know two three weeks and then and then go from there. If they've if they're if they're you know, having a flare and go on steroids and not losing weight and feeling well, two COVID vaccinations and their school, um, this is usually, you know, the high school students, then, then uh, it, you know, I, I'm not as dogmatic about missing, missing the school. Um, in terms of, of, you know, the, the, the vaccination, um, if they've had two and they're, they're put on steroids, most of the most of the kids, um, you know, are going to get off the steroids, so there's a there's an end end limit to it. And so I have typically said, wait two weeks after you get off your steroids until you get the next vaccination. And this 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 length of time helps with with the boost response anyway. There's very few, you know, that I would ever even consider leaving on long term steroids, and then it's it's sort of. Well, I guess a, a vaccine is, is better than nothing, but it's it's so unusual that um, I usually wait till they're, say, suggest they get off their steroids for a couple of weeks and then have a vaccination then. That's great. And, and do you agree that if, uh, you know, if they're on high dose steroids and they haven't had any vaccines, should they wait to get the vaccine until things are tapered, knowing that it might just be a few weeks? Yeah, like I always think of a, the window, if there's a window where you'll have less immune suppression, so you'll have hopefully a better immune response. But again, you have to balance on what kind of exposure that that individual will have. So it's, it's a it's a risk balance. But I, I agree with uh, Dr. Mack. Yeah, we're fortunate enough right now in most of Canada, yeah. the rates are fairly low. And so it's pretty safe to wait, I guess. But if if things start to spike again, that's a different changes the, uh, the, the guidelines, I guess. And one, really? one caveat to that, and this is actually more of an adult gastroenterology perspective, um, is we're, we're seeing a number of people now who are vaccine hesitant, even within the IBD community. And we're, you know, some of them are getting sick, um, not unrelated to COVID-19, they're getting sick from their IBD. And sometimes that kind of is an opportunity to have a conversation around getting the COVID vaccine, what would happen if you get COVID. And so for many of our colleagues, sometimes we actually just say, you know what, Let's just get, let's get this done, even if we're putting it on prednisone, because this is a window where we're actually affecting the change in decision. Um, and again, this may not be as relevant for children or, or families with with IBD and things like that. But I'm finding a lot of my colleagues are now in in that you know that subset. And again, it's a relatively small subset that are vaccine hesitant. Often, when they're getting sick with their IBD, it's it's a window to to get them vaccinated at that stage. Um, and then, you know, just because I'm we're sensitive a little bit on, on time, I think one of the really important questions, and maybe I'll, I'll ask this to Anne, is that the data that was presented was um, a recommendation to wait 
eight weeks between the first and the second dose. Of course, that was from NASI and Health Canada was more kind of the manufacturer recommendation of three weeks. And it just if, if you wanted to just kind of explain that decision and, and why waiting eight weeks is an, an important thing to do. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it's a good question. We, we get it a lot as well. Um, so the, the decision that NASI made to, to recommend a longer interval, so eight weeks, uh, or at least eight weeks uh, between the first and the second dose uh, was based on uh, principles of vaccinology. So in general, um, it's nice to have a bit of time between, uh, I guess, the immune system seeing that vaccine or that uh, antigen. Um, and what we normally see is like a, a little blip when you get first exposure, you give it a bit of time, it refines itself a little bit more, and then you have a very, very strong uh, peak that's more robust and sustained. Um, and this is actually what um, one of the recommendations early on for adults um, uh, at the beginning of the vaccine rollout when, you know, supply was low uh, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine availability across the country. And, um, you know, you had to balance up the, you know, do you vaccinate as many people as you can, depending on the the, the, the cases in the in the community uh, and it was deemed it was offered as a recommendation that you could space out those two doses and so this recommendation in children but also on the most recent recommendations for adults is also based on now we actually have data to, to show because we have the exp the real life experience of what happened to those people who received their, their two doses spaced out eight weeks 12 weeks apart and there's now um, uh, a lot of studies that report that when you actually uh, have an increased interval between the doses, you have a more robust immune response. Um, so that was, so for the children's, uh, the five to 11 um, pediatric vaccine, the recommendation, the eight week is, you know, based on, on that principle of probably better immune response, uh, which hopefully will lead to better effectiveness. Um, and the second reason is also um, because of the, potential safety signal, the safety signal about the myocarditis and pericarditis. Um, uh, since the early reports back in the spring, we have more data. It's been observed, like Eric was saying, it's observed a little bit more um, in young men, young adolescent around the, you know, they range from 12 to 30, but more around that 16 to 16, 17, early 20s age, more after the second dose, um, more with the Moderna. Uh, compared to the Pfizer vaccine, and more when they uh, were close um, in, uh, with a shorter interval. So the thought was if you space them out, hopefully we will also decrease uh, that, that risk uh, and potentially increase safety. Just to, to add to that, I mean, just to reinforce that our studies showed that as well, you know, with the, uh, the range was, I think, uh, uh, 42 to 85 days and the the other i think the, the median was about 46 the uh so more to the lower end but the other part of this is by spacing it out you also potentially increase the longevity of the response too so longer duration of higher antibody levels with the strategy we, in fact, are seeing that in Ontario, there's been very good real world data presented from Ontario that showed that younger people, anyway, people under 60 or 70, because we spaced it out by eight to 12 weeks at the beginning, we're not seeing that waning immunity and increasing infection like they did see in Israel and the United States. So the, the need for a booster seems to have been delayed, at least it's, it's obviously not zero for the general population. For IBD patients who are immunosuppressed, you need a booster. But for everybody else, if you got it eight to 12 weeks apart, you actually probably are safer. And I think Eric, you, you said it really nicely in your presentation about the difference between Health Canada and, and NASI and how NASI is, is able to look at all of the data uh, beyond just the clinical trial. Um, and, you know, and, and so that provides these nuances and understanding that allow for these different recommendations. And one small shout out I just want to do is I, I just want to thank all the members of NASI for the work that they've done. Um, they, they've, it's going to be close to two years that they've volunteered their time. These are brilliant clinicians and scientists from all over the country, all different areas of expertise who, you know, have spent countless hours pouring over the data and making extremely difficult decisions. So it's, it's a, I'm really, really thankful for having 
uh, those individuals being able to support um, not just everyone in Canada, but particularly the, our IBD community. Um, one I, thing I, I should say, Gil, they, they were hugely criticized, right? At the beginning, they, there was a lot of criticism about NASI recommendations, and we should make t-shirts, NASI was right. Because <laughs> honestly, there's very few of their recommendations that they made over the, over the past year that was incorrect. They really got it right a lot of the time, yeah. which is and, pretty and, impressive. And obviously not to di digress, but a lot of that time too, if you think about a year ago, we were in a situation where we had, you know, limited supplies of vaccines and, you know, in medicine, we have to triage and, and the same thing, they had to make recommendations that we're trying to, how do we best use the vaccines? And, and fortunate we're in a country right now where, um, you know, approval comes through um, and a week later, vaccines are, are in Canada enough to vaccinate every five to 11 year old across the country at least once. And, and that's, you know, we're so fortunate to live in a country like that. And, and I think these decisions now, um, I don't think you have to take in consideration supply, per, you just have to take consideration the best science now. Um, and, and then um, now to kind of move away from that, but one of the things that we, we wanted to do with the, the, this webinar too, is just to talk a little bit of some of the, the myths or concerns that people are, are raising that have kind of come up on the internet and social media and things like that. And um, one of them, and, and these, these questions are, we, anyone in the panel can, can answer, but one of them is, you know, with one dose of the vaccine, two dose, now we're getting three doses of a vaccine. Is it possible that vaccines can actually stress our immune systems and cause um, things to go bad or wonky. And I'm just, and, and again, maybe, and maybe that's a, a good question for, for you to ask is like, is there, is there an issue or problem with over vaccinating? No, I mean, our immune system is, is built to deal with like innumerable different antigens, right? Nobody lives in a bubble. We don't know that actually, or everyone that's listening and all the panelists, uh, our immune system is right now working really hard to to defend ourselves. So, so uh, no, I don't think that um, we'll have too many vaccines or overstress the immune system. Um, it's been designed to be that way. And then the next question, maybe, it's, oh, sorry, go, go. No, no, I was gonna say, I think it works better when we continue to stress and stimulate our immune systems. And, and the one, one thing I will add too is just like Dr. Jacobson's study, like this is, there are studies for every single dose that gets approved, first dose, second dose, third dose, theoretically fourth dose. There are a tremendous amount of research that goes around each of those doses too. So to, to make sure that, that there isn't a surprise. Um, the, the next kind of myth or question is, and we addressed it a little bit earlier, I think with uh, Dave's comments too, but is this, can vaccines trigger a flare of inflammatory bowel disease? And um, Eric, I know that you've actually done a lot of research in, in this area. I'm wondering if you wanted to provide some comments on that. Well, I mean, I, I did the research in the flu vaccine with a flu vaccine study using Ontario-wide data, and it showed no evidence that it flared it. And in fact, maybe it actually protects you if you get the flu vaccine in the years that you get it. But we actually did a, a very detailed review of this topic when we made the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology Clinical Practice Guidelines for immunizations, because that's obviously the top question is safety, right, in, in patients with IBD. And there was absolutely no evidence at all in the literature, you know, beyond small case series of somebody reporting, oh, the IBD flared up after getting a vaccine, anything larger than that, there was no sign that any vaccine that we have flares up your IBD. And so that really was a bit of a non-starter for that, that clinical practice guidelines group that, you know, we can very well recommend the safety of vaccines for IBD patients because it doesn't seem to cause any problems, not just in IBD, by the way, we looked at other immune-mediated inflammatory disease as well, but things like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, and vaccines do not flare up those diseases either. So I think we can safely rule that out, that there is no evidence that a vaccine will flare up the IBD. Um, and then just an, uh, an, another question is that many parents are just worried that this is a new vaccine. These mRNA vaccines, you know, were new. I know Eric, you covered a little bit of this in your presentation around the process of a clinical trial, but, um, you know, should we be worried if, because it's the new vaccine in our, in our, our children in regards to long-term risks? I think I said my piece. I'd like to hear, Anne, am I right that there has not been a vaccine in human history that has a side effect longer than 60 days after you give it? You know, I'm really glad you stressed this out because this is definitely a lot. The, the thing I, one of the things I hear the most is like, what's going to happen in 10 years or 15 years and all that? And you're right, like vaccine side effects 
Um, most of them occur within a few days or a few weeks of receiving the vaccine. And, um, you know, really very little um, beyond uh, the, the six weeks. I mean, we, we say eight weeks. And in reporting, usually we use 42 days as our, as our um, window or, or period of surveillance. Um, so, so that I, I completely agree with you. Um, even in all the side effects that have been reported with the COVID-19 vaccine in adults and all of that, uh, side effects all occurred um, shortly after the, the vaccine, Not, like all within, you know, a couple of weeks of the vaccine. Nothing was over, you know, uh, many months after. Um, and then parents will tell me, well, well, why, why are they doing the studies and following long term? So the, the long term part is to follow the actually the, the immune protection or the immunogenicity over time. It's not as much for the safety. The safety is really within that initial period after receiving the dose of the vaccine. Although they are still documenting. It's not like we're, still we're, still documenting we're not stopping. No, we're, we're not, not ignoring stopping. safety. But, no, we're not uh, ignoring. But really, the purpose of the really long term is really for for the immunogenicity. Yeah. And uh, mRNA vaccines, I mean, it's a new delivery system, right? But it's not, it, that mRNA part of things goes away within days of it being injected. It, I think it was within five days, any component of the vaccine is gone from your system. So there's no reason to think that it, it will be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, your, your point, MR, MR, the actual mRNA has been around for decades in terms of a therapeutic perspective. What was kind of revolutionary that allowed it to kind of transition to human health was the packaging, the lipid um, uh, layer around it that allowed it to be delivered to the cells. That was the huge kind of invention that then kind of really sparked this. And, and if I could flip one kind of positive side, I think of, of this is um, that right now outside of COVID-19, there are a number of studies and uh, vaccines that are being developed for other vaccines, or sorry, other viruses, particularly ones that we've notoriously had a very difficult time in treating, uh, and not just uh, viruses in, um, in, in North America, but even um, viruses like Ebola and things like that in Africa. So I actually think as we gain the experience with COVID-19, the acceleration of our understanding of all of this technology has been such a huge investment um, we're going to see a number of products come out uh, in the next decade that is going to really revolutionize how we treat infectious diseases. You know, if there's any bright side of this pandemic, you know, I think it's our, our speed at which that we're moving uh, will hopefully continue to a certain extent. Uh, Dr. Jacobson actually just sends his regrets. He had to go see a couple of patients, so he had to drop off the call a little bit early. Uh, Gil, I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Can you briefly talk about whether there's data now on whether the vaccine actually reduces the risk of COVID-19 infection in IBD patients? I know this is going to be primarily in older teenagers and adults, but members of our audience have asked about this. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you see the vast majority of studies previously, like hist historically, I mean, historically meaning in the last year, um, have really focused on developing, do you develop antibodies? Um, and, and then you can then look at you know, complex antibodies like neutralizing antibodies that then um, work to eradicate the virus theoretically. Um, and, but the, the big question is, do you actually prevent COVID-19 infections? And that's harder to do because you need a much larger sample size and you need a, a much longer follow-up um, period. Um, and luckily we've now have a few um, studies, particularly in the IBD community, um, where there's large enough databases, meaning there's a large enough people who have IBD and received the vaccine versus those who didn't receive the vaccine, that we can start to see what happens, not about antibody levels, but actually about COVID infections after the two doses of the vaccine. And there's two large studies that have been published um, recently. One in the US where they use data from the VA um, uh, hospitals and the other from, from Israel, which has benefited from kind of early use of the vaccine. And they, they actually prioritize immunocompromised individuals, including those with IBD early on in the vaccine. So like back early in the, in the spring in, of, of 2020. So there's enough uh, sorry, 2021. So there's enough data now to actually follow them up. And both of these studies actually looked in the tens of thousands of people with IBD. So these are very large studies. And what they wanted to look at was what is your risk of actually being diagnosed with COVID after the, the two dose of the vaccine in those 
com uh, compared to the general population in, in one study and compared to people with IBD who didn't get vaccinated. So first, the study in the US compared those with IBD who were vaccinated versus those who didn't. And the ones who were vaccinated with IBD, regardless of the fact that most of them were on immunocompromised medications, many of which were the, the drugs that our audience are on, drugs like Remicade and Humira and Stellara and Zelljans and, and um, Intivio, um, the rate of the actual rate of infections in that group was very small. It was like 0.1% uh, and very few, very few cases that were, were serious infections. Um, and that was actually significantly less, almost a tenfold less than individuals IBD who, who didn't get vaccinated around the same time that the vaccinated patients did. And then the study in Israel actually then said, well, what about IBD patients risk compared to the general population? And again, the most important thing is that the absolute risk of getting a COVID infection was very low, with around 0.1%. Uh, and again, and only a small, small fraction of those had serious, serious infections, for example, going into hospital. Um, and the risk for the most part was actually on par with the general population. There was a small signal that maybe if you had Crohn's disease and you're immunocompromised, the risk of getting an infection was a little bit higher than that of um, the general population. And again, and that, that highlights the, the fact that we probably need a third dose like these were all people have two doses didn't if didn't include um, the third dose um, and so hopefully these small marginal differences we're going to we're going to capture by by the third dose and when are you recommending the third dose for, to your patients Gil? yes so generally speaking we want to say at least eight weeks um, from the second dose um, is, is kind of the minimum, Sim similar to the, the children recommendation. So we do want it to space out a little bit. Um, if you look at the CLARITY study, if those are on anti-TNF, they started to wean those antibodies around 16 to 18 weeks. So it's typically at least eight weeks and trying to get to that 16 to 18 weeks. Some people have recommended as far as, as six months, but it just, just given the fact that the antibodies are decaying, we, um, you know, I generally are, are saying kind of not really later than 16 to 18 weeks if possible. And Anne, you treat a lot of children with other immunodeficiencies, obviously pretty severe immunodeficiencies. What are you usually recommending for them in terms of the third dose? Yeah, so it, it depends, right? Like, so, so the third dose can be a, a, a third dose of a primary series. So like, again, in the concept that some patients who are, are, are immune, quite immune suppressed, they don't mount even after the first or second, they need that third dose. So it's like a three dose series almost versus the booster where they actually did mount a good response, but then antibody levels do go down, which it goes down on everyone. That's kind of normal antibody life, but maybe faster or whatnot, and they need that, that boost. So, um, you know, I would say in general, I've done that, like for the first series, I would just say like do that three dose series, eight weeks apart between uh, the doses. Um, but again, it also depends on if there's a lot circulating in, in the area. So my recommendation change it change a little bit uh, along the uh, the, um, the the different waves and and then before school and all of that. So at least for the teens. Yeah. And Dave, yourself, are you recommending the third dose for teens? Yeah, uh, we are, and just uh, following the recommendations uh, that are out there for it. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I think with that, we will wrap things up. I think uh, we gave people a lot of information <laughs> through the past hour, hour and a half. And I hope you hear our message overall, uh, our message being, please vaccinate your children. Uh, bo both of us, Gil and I, uh, with young children are going to do so. I hope you'll s you see based on the data that the vaccine is very effective in children uh, and that we think that it's safe. Uh, you know, there's still that rare side effect question, but that rare side effect, the myocarditis, the risk is much lower than if you get COVID. So again, I think the bottom line is please vaccinate your children. It's better for them if they have IBD. It's not going to interrupt their medications. You know, we're, we're going to keep them as stable as possible from the IBD perspective and keep them as healthy as possible from the COVID-19 perspective. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Jacobson, who actually, who unfortunately had to step away, uh, Dr. Pham Hui for joining us again, and Dr. Mack, who serves on the task force, the COVID-19 task force. Uh, obviously my co-host, Gil, thank you very much again, Gil. We will be doing this again, uh, likely in the new year with some updated information about the third dose booster and probably uh, more in real world evidence about how well the third dose booster is working in IBD patients, hopefully. Uh, if not in immunosuppressed patients and 
spoilers, it's working really well. There have been a couple of studies that looked at solid tumors, patients and patients with, immuno, uh, with um, immunodeficiencies, and it seems to work extremely well, organ transplant, sorry, and it seems to work very well. So uh, yes, get your third dose if you can. Uh, another sort of little spoiler is that the task force will be meeting probably in the next week or two to revise that risk diagram that we have on the website. Uh, there's a section on the COVID-19 website for Crohn's and Colitis Canada saying, are you at risk? And that is sort of a leftover. It's a holdover from before there were vaccines. And I think we're at the stage where the task force is likely going to recommend a little bit of a loosening, right? Again, like we heard about it with steroid patients now, that if you've been fully vaccinated, you're on short-term steroids, you're not that sick, you probably don't need to stay at home with your doors locked and your windows closed. That I think, especially for kids, it's important that they go to school. And so uh, that I suspect that the task force will modify that based on whether or not somebody has had a full series of vaccines, uh, either two or three doses, depending on what age they are. So stay tuned to that in December. We'll send out a notification when, when the website is changed. If you have any further questions, you are more than welcome to email learn at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. It may be something that we can answer, or it may be something that we save for the next webinar to answer. And as usual, if you find these webinars useful, uh, please give feedback. We want to know what you want to hear next. We want to know how we did, and we want to improve. Uh, and particularly as well, uh, well, I want to thank the frontline workers as always. I think now we're all back to work, so we're all sort of frontline workers. And uh, thank you for doing your job and staying safe. There's more COVID-19 resources available at these web pages. And please follow us on social. And I'm waiting for the uh, donate slide. I don't, ah, there it is. There it is. It's my usual spiel, right? My usual thing is that, yes, this takes work. This all takes work. We're still not back to in-person fundraising events, unfortunately, hopefully very soon. Crohn's and Colitis Canada is still doing its best to raise funds virtually, but if you find these webinars useful, please, please donate to Crohn's and Colitis uh, at Crohn's and Colitis uh, The Gutsy Walk is coming up, uh, as Laurie mentioned, in June, but you can also text CURE to 20222 to donate $25 to Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and we would greatly appreciate it. It really helps us put on these programs to help you. So with that, I'll say good night. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, everyone, uh, panelists and presenters, and we will see you soon. Take care, everybody.